Now, what I'd like to do in just a very few minutes is quite quickly preview uh, a paper I'll be giving in the uh, World Trade Organization uh, in the Graduate Institute in Geneva in a couple of weeks' time. So it's not in your folder, and maybe in a couple of weeks it'll be posted on the, on the uh, Institute's website. But the, the title of the paper is Climate and Trade, Looking for Ways to Avoid a, a Train Wreck. Now, the, the WTO is just one part of this larger show that, uh, that Jake talked about, and I certainly agree on that. But as everyone in this room knows, the WTO is in hard times to now, in these days, as a negotiating forum. And here we have this, uh, this climate um, issue, you know, barreling down the, the track. And as Jake said, uh, the WTO is not going to be bailed out by some top-down uh, set of rules coming out of uh, the UNFCCC that they could just say, well, the UNFCCC said this, and if you're in conformity with that, then everything's okay. That's uh, clearly not going to happen anytime soon out of the UNFCCC. And instead, we have this much more difficult uh, bottom-up procedure evolving, difficult maybe not for climate, maybe that'll be great progress, but difficult for the WTO to cope with because while the WTO appellate body has recognized other international institutions, it doesn't defer to them, it recognizes them when it makes decisions. I mean, you can't do the same with all the, you know, state, municipal, regional, national, uh, standards, labeling systems, whatever might evolve, so that you can't give that same level of deference that it might to a, a top-down uh, procedure. So what, uh, what, uh, uh, how will the WTO cope with this? And, and our remit in this paper is to kind of just throw out some ideas, and in a couple of weeks' time I'll have a better idea of what the uh, mavens in Geneva think about, about these various ideas. Well, the course of least resistance is just to let the dispute settlement system inside the WTO grind out decisions. And it does grind out decisions, and after a decade or so of multiple decisions, we'll have a much better feeling of the contours between the uh, two systems, that is the climate system or climate rules and, uh, and WTO uh, uh, interpretations. Uh, as Fred mentioned in our book, we go into great detail, but the, the areas of conflict are just enormous. And unless you think that uh, the WTO system is going to, going to completely defer to any climate measure that, that influences the trade system under a very broad reading of Article 20, then, there, then these conflicts will need to be sorted out case by case and so forth. The problem with that is it's, it will take quite a long time it will probably call into question the legitimacy of the uh, of the appellate body system and the WTO dispute settlement system because some will say it's much too strict, some will say it's much too lenient. But anyway, that is the course of least resistance to do nothing and to uh, let the system work its way. The second approach which we uh, uh, discuss is a code approach either inside or outside the WTO. A code approach implies a handful of countries, hopefully the important ones. Of course, you could ask if these important countries can agree inside the WTO, why can't they agree inside the UNFCCC? And um, that's a legitimate question. And so it might only be a few of the important countries, such as the United States and Europe and Japan and Canada and Australia, and you know who's been admitted when you recite that list, at least as starters. But a code approach which basically recognizes um, uh, legitimate measures, tries to deal with the subsidy angle, the border adjustments, at least between code members, so that they're not litigating within the WTO, or at least litigating to a much lesser extent than they otherwise would when trade, uh, when trade is interfered with by, uh, by uh, climate measures. Um, a third approach which we throw out, which is uh, now well outside the kind of common uh, 
conception of the WTO would be to create an arbitration forum for private forum, for private firms using WTO rules. And the reason we throw this out as a, as a possibility is that there are going to be labeling rules. There are going to be California standards. There are going to be, you know, everything under the, under the sun coming up. And private firms will be very affected by this. But as you know, only governments have standing to bring disputes to the WTO. But the WTO does have rules, and it will have more rules as decisions are made. So maybe an arbitration forum could be, uh, <coughs> uh, could be constituted, uh, perhaps not have any binding effect, but would have a very heavy influencing effect. Another quite ambitious idea, uh, either in the uh, parallel with a long dragged out Doha round, if it lasts another five years, or as a sequence to the Doha round, would be a green round within the WTO, which would then have as a core element the elimination of barriers on environmental goods and services, another item that Jake mentioned, uh, and um, would deal with the rules of the uh, agreement on subsidies and countervailing measures, which were written without any contemplation, really, of, the, uh, of what we face in the climate area, deal with green labels and so forth. I mean, there's a lot that could be done. The next approach, and, and saying these are all not, these are not exclusive, these could be done, maybe none of them were done, but could be done along with each other in parallel, is a peace clause. And the Kerry Lieberman bill goes a long way towards that because Kerry Lieberman pushes the date back by comparison with Waxman Markey a uh, few years, but more importantly, it gives a lot of discretion to the president, which means, importantly under the WTO, that there's no, even if Kerry Lieberman was passed as written, there is no immediate case that anybody can bring because this is, you know, this is possible. If you had legislation that makes it mandatory, then in anticipation of an actual uh, imposition, then uh, a case could be brought. But under the existing WTO jurisprudence, no case now. And further, you know, 2023 is a long ways away and a lot of room for negotiation and so forth. So a more formal idea of that would be a peace clause all around. That's not the way uh, President Sarkozy is going because he wants taxes kind of right away. Um, now, another thing that the WTO could contribute is this uh, area of fossil fuel subsidies. As was mentioned earlier, the G20 has said, you know, we ought to get rid of these things. And actually, if you look at the numbers, or when I've looked at the numbers, if, it, if all countries got rid of the fossil fuel subsidies, that would probably do more in the next five or eight years than all the, you know, kind of green energy bills that are going to be passed. And, nuclear power and so forth and so on. I mean, it's a terrific amount of subsidies, a couple hundred billion dollars. Well, what the WTO could contribute to this is measurement and a uh, name and shame report. And the WTO did pioneering work uh, in, in the 1990s on uh, agricultural subsidies, and it has some very capable, uh, very, very strong capabilities and capable people to do this kind of measuring uh, which is, is, is critical, and the existing measurement of fossil fuel subsidies is quite primitive. So that would be a, a, a real contribution and hopefully forcing them down. <coughs> and <coughs> in the same vein, the WTO could begin to measure green subsidies, of which all this legislation has a lot of. The ETS system in Europe, filled with subsidies, Waxman, Markey, Kerry Lieberman, it's all there. And it all raises issues under the uh, under the WTO, and at least to start measuring them and uh, comparing them would be very uh, very constructive. Then there's the green labels. Uh, these are sprouting up, you know, like dandelions all over by different groups, usually well-meaning, very different across groups. I mean, and honestly different as to what is green and what is not, and. Uh, the WTO has some nascent work which could be highly accelerated uh, for this. Um, the one 
And let me just end maybe with just one other point. There are other things that could be thrown in. Uh, but I know that in other forum, not this morning, but uh, or not this afternoon, but other times, uh, Arvind has been a great supporter of a carbon tax and has the company of Stiglitz and others. Uh, I think this is a disaster. I won't go into the details of it. Uh, but at least what the, um, <coughs> the uh, WTO might do, and this is, this is pretty, uh, uh, again, pretty far-reaching. If we're going to have a carbon tax or if we're going to impose permits on other countries when they send their goods to you, at least it would be good to have a top-down system for measuring, you know, what are or defining what are appropriate carbon taxes, or um, or permit systems. Um, I wouldn't have any objection to a carbon tax if Arvin were designing it, or especially if I were designing it. But neither of us is going to design it. It's going to be designed by the K streets of this world. And those of you, which is probably most of the people in this room who know the anti-dumping system, know what that really means. So I think it would be a, uh, it'd be a very heavy blow on the world trading system. But it may be an, an inevitable blow. Thank you very much. Thanks to uh, Jake Arvin and uh, uh, Gary for leading us off. Uh, I just want to start off with a question myself, and that's to Jake. Uh, if I heard you right, Jake, you characterize the current institutional framework as fractured and fragmented, rife with incoherence and ripe for conflict. If that's the case, why don't we dust off the idea that Dan Esty proposed in a book at this institute 15 years ago, when he proposed creating a GEO, a global environmental organization, that would wrap under one institutional roof all the different aspects of the issue. He wrote it, those of you who read it may recall, in a book called Greening the Gap. The origin of the book was to figure out how the gap should be applied to environmental issues. But the more Dan thought about it, he said, the environmental community really needs a body of doctrine and an institution of its own that would be more or less the equivalent of the GATT, and then the two could get together on equal footing. And for that and a variety of other reasons, he came up with the proposal for a GEO, which from time to time has had support from different governments around the world, but has not proceeded. So my question, Jake, given this fragmentation, incoherence, uh, fractured system, um, should we sort of just go along with that, or should we who are supposed to be proposing uh, creative and constructive ideas for dealing with this whole range of issues, should we sort of go in a way to first principles and suggest a big picture institutional reform of that or some other type to try to recreate some coherence and uh, consistency. Oh, thanks, thanks, Fred. Um, I think I fear the geo in the same way that Gary fears c carbon taxes. Uh, that there is there's an equivalent to Castry out there that that could could make such a hash of the creation of a, a global environmental organization or a world uh, environmental organization that. Um, even though I am someone who, who has a lot of faith in international institutions, even if it's misplaced, um, I, I wouldn't want to invest uh, a great deal of, of diplomatic time and, um, and resources into trying to create something like that. Um, and I think it's, it's part because I think the, the, the problem with, that we're seeing in terms of the fracturing landscape is due to a lack of faith in international institutions. Um, and not due to the absence of one overarching international uh, institution. And I think that that lack of faith is still going to be there. And the, the very open-ended mandate of, of what supporters of GEO w would like it to have would not be a place in which you could create, create trust and confidence and, and, and give it the authority or the mandate that people think it might need to solve problems. 
Um, so I, I think part of the problem with climate change is, is this lack of faith in institutions. The other is that it's, it's too big of a, of a, it's bitten off too big of a problem to solve on its own. Uh, and what you'd be asking the GEO or the WEO or Dan would be asking the GEO or the WEO to do is to bite off an even larger chunk. And I, I just don't see that working. So, so your, your opposition is on grounds of practicality, not desirability. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I guess we could all imagine the, the world in which we would like it to be. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure whether Geo or Weo would be part of that world that I would imagine. But I, I think what we need now are, are problem-solving processes that are very specific and very focused. And Geo or Weo is just a very, very diverse – it hasn't really even defined the problem accurately, I, I don't think. Um, and, and so, therefore, it, it doesn't seem to me something that would solve the problem. Okay. Fair enough. Floor is open for questions, comments, and the mic is coming around. Is it me? <coughs> me? Yep. Yeah, Ernie Prigg again. Uh, this is a WTO-related question, and, and my memory is a little fuzzy, but some of you folks might be. In the Uruguay round, uh, first few years, not much happened on environment. The environmental was on the defensive, just trying to hold off protections. But then the last year or two, uh, there was this framework agreement for environmental policy as part of the new WTO uh, to be implemented and, and all the specifics to be, uh, you know, uh, adopted by the new organization. And an irony was that it was toward the end, the last year or two, it was the U.S. with the environmental groups pushing for this framework protocol agreement, the new WTO. But then when it really started and got down to specifics, the U.S. blocked almost everything from Mexican tuna boats to turtles and in Indians, in Sri Lanka, whatever it was, because we didn't want to uh, restrict our unilateral actions, where we would be more forceful, with uh, you know, multilateral commitments. Uh, and, and, and since then, I haven't heard much about it. Maybe I'm just not close to it. But my question is, it's still there in the WTO. Is, it, is anybody trying to actually spell, implement it in, in the specific obligations that are implied with it? And is the U.S. and the U.S. environmental groups in particular still opposed to any of the specific proposals because that would limit our scope of unilateral action where we want to be more proactive? Well, let me just take a brief stab at that, Ernie. Um, I mean, the, the conflict which um, Steve Charnovitz, I think, first identified in more than 10 years ago is that the, um, the WTO, with very few exceptions, and you've named some of them, is, is opposed to the concept of um, BPMs, product and process methods, production and process methods, whereas the climate area is all about BPMs. So there's a, a fundamental conceptual conflict. Now, the WTO has provided a little space, a little space, and you name one of the cases. There's an, an asbestos case as well. Uh, but it has certainly not opened the door to BPM. So that's a very basic uh, issue, and that there is no active discussion on, you know, writing the rules. No, I know, but I'm just telling you, there's no, there's, there's no active discussion on that. Where the active discussion is in the WTO right now is on environmental goods and services. That's what it came down to. Yes, there's this committee. It met many times. It achieved nothing so far as we can see on the outside. But it, there is the environmental goods and services concept, which, ha however, has also run into uh, very great difficulties, starting with the fact that there's no agreed list of environmental goods and services. But the concept is to eliminate tariffs and barriers on them. So that's kind of where the WTO stands right now. Um, well, I think the, the innovation that came from the Uruguay round was the establishment of this Standing Committee on Trade and Environment. Um, and it has regularly taken up the issue of what the relationship between the WTO and multilateral environmental agreements should look like, including by regularly hearing reports from the secretariats of MEAs that use trade measures like CITES, uh, the Trade and Endangered Species, and fisheries agreements that allow parties to ban the landing of fish that have been taken illegally. Um, it, it hears those reports and doesn't object to them. And so there's kind of like been a culture of the recognition by the WTO that there are other 
regimes out there that are regulating trade for non-free trade purposes, but instead for, for promoting the conservation of, of endangered species or fisheries, et cetera. So I think that there, there, there's been a, that has resulted with a, um, a, a more appreciative culture that, that there's more than one institution that's regulating trade and they, it can regulate trade for different purposes. As part of the Doha round, there is a mandate to try to clarify that relationship between the WTO and MEAs further. Um, as far as I understand, that has gone, that has gone nowhere uh, because those who really want to show deference to the MEAs are essentially trying to carve out an exception for MEAs. They want the, the, the negotiations to lead to a recognition of at least some set of MEAs that uh, were they to authorize or justify a trade measure than any trade measure under those MEAs would be recognized as WTO consistent, and those that are, that are, are concerned that that might lead to, um, to protectionism. Um, so uh, as, as far as I understand, that's as far as that, that piece of the debate has gone. Where was the U.S. on this? Where was the U.S. on this? Um, I, I don't know. Um, yeah. And during NAFTA. Yeah, I mean, I, I do. I, I do think this was an issue that was pushed by the European Union. They're, they're the ones that got it onto the agenda. The, the idea that there should be an explicit agreement on the relationship with the MEAs and the WTO. And, I, and my guess is that the U.S. resisted that, but I couldn't, couldn't be 100 percent sure. Okay. Yes. Uh, thank you, Carl Dahlman, Georgetown University. First of all, I want to, to thank you, Fred, for putting together this and everybody's participation. It's been really very. Uh, very stimulating. I wanted to raise uh, four, four issues. Uh, one of them is what is the expectation, and this is to the whole panel, of how likely it is that we're going to have some kind of environmental legislation pass, or what, whatever kind. That's the first one. The second one, then, listening to the discussion, especially this afternoon, I'm very concerned that even if that is passed, the implications of that is going to be so difficult in terms of sorting out because of all this very big fragmentation that it's going to be very difficult to get to action. And so I was wondering where, where there's a silver lining in that. The third part then is I agree very much with what Arvind proposed. I mean, really, there's a very big issue of equity, this need for a big mindset change. The money is not there. The equity issue is not going to make that come because people have the money now are the developing countries and they're the other side of the equity side. And then the real question then is how can this be addressed? And I don't see it coming from here except for the big technology push. But the big technology push is not going to come because we don't have a mechanism that is giving us the pricing to make the technology response kick in. I mean, technology came and saved us from the limits to growth because the prices of commodities went up. We had all that. But if we don't have some way of pricing environment, this goes back to the first question, we're not going to get the technology to kick in. In any way, to make the kind of change Arvin's talking about, you need a massive Manhattan-type project, which is nowhere on the cards. And this is made more complicated, back to the first question, because if you look at the Waxman bill or, or the, 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 the Kerry bill, most of the benefits of whatever kind of pricing are given back to the consumers. It's not invested in trying to change the frontier. Then the final part is, I'm very concerned, that if we don't make progress on all this, the more likely solution is going to be some geoengineering where some country shoots something into space to block the sun, or we do something with the oceans. And the consequences of that are perhaps even more disastrous. So I've come out uh, very concerned, and I, anybody who wants to take any of the four issues, I'll be most grateful. All right, let me invite the panel to do it, and invite Trevor or anybody else who wants to weigh in on the first question, the outlook for legislation. Also, let me apologize, I've got to duck out a couple minutes early here, turn the chair over to Gary. So who wants to lead off? Arvind. Uh, <laughs> I leave the environmental legislation to, to folks who know more than, than I do. Um, I, I think you've put your finger on this. I mean, the technology push requires, I think, both a, a lot of Manhattan Project type funding, public private sector, and it needs the right incentives. Um, now, it needs the right pricing. In my view of uh, things, you know, the only way that works, which is equitable, is if the pricing comes a lot from early and ambitious actions in the rich world. Uh, because raising the price of carbon immediately in, in my country will be completely uh, uh, not possible. Um, so, so, so the rich world, I think, should 
do the early action. And on technology, frankly, it should be an international effort to which everyone, you know, the Chinas and the Indians of the world should contribute because fiscally perhaps they're better capable than even the United States to contribute some of that. So that would be my, my, my broad take on how it could possibly be squared. On the, on the geoengineering, you know, I know nothing about it, except that I read this very thoughtful piece by Martin Weitzman, who, says, who said that, you know, if you look at what's happening in the absence now, the, the risks are so great now that, you know, at least as a stopgap measure, we have to put geoengineering on the table. We shouldn't rule it out completely because of the way the status quo is evolving. Jake? I mean, I think our biggest hope for passing legislation is that the stories that are told around it are based on the kind of analysis that Trevor and his colleagues are coming up with, that at least the first step that's necessary for the U.S. to take to start limiting its emissions actually brings benefits to the economy. Um, and, and that, that's a tough sell, but I think it's, it's a sell that, that basically is, is essential. And you, know, you hear the president saying it. Um, the problem with that is that I, I think there's a turning point with that, uh, that, that you, you may be able to, to wring the first slice of emissions out of the system by selling it to the American public that it's good for jobs, et cetera. But there, there is a point, given the size of this problem and the legitimate demands of developing countries about how much more quickly the industrialized world really needs to move on this issue. Uh, there is a point at which you actually have to be making arguments about moving because it's for a global public good and for us to solve the problem of climate change and not continually burying that issue within legislation that pretends to be about American jobs and American consumers. And, and that's the, I think, you know, in, in, the, in the things that I worry about, I, I worry about that even, even more. Let me just make two quick comments. I think uh, as far as we're how, the, how it's going to be addressed, where the money comes from. Uh, my view is it should come from $100 a ton CO2 in the rich countries, and that will drive a lot of savings. But that's so far above the numbers which anybody's talking about now that we're a ways away. And then eventually, $100 a ton for China and eventually for India. But uh, that's that's my practical notion, but I, I realize that pol politically it's not there. On for geoengineering, actually I think that's a lot quicker. I think that what's going to happen, we're going to have a crisis at some point. And the question is, who is going to decide on the geoengineering? Now the scientists are already uh, alert on this, as you probably know, there's the Asilomar II group, which is studying the kind of thing that, um, that Arvin talked about. and. Uh, I think the question will be who gets to implement it. And, you know, you have some countries which are suffering huge droughts, huge hurricanes, so forth, rising sea level, and maybe the technology, they can implement it. And uh, then if we can't agree now on the UNFCCC, how are we going to agree on, the, on who gets to make the decisions on geoengineering? But I do think that question uh, within the next 10 years will get quite lively. Who gets to be the crank? Yeah, who gets? Please. Margaret Pearson from the University of Maryland. Um, we've talked a lot through the day today about uh, the divide between the developed and the developing world and also talked about the basic group of negotiators, but I'm wondering if any of you could uh, make some observations about the robustness of the basic group. Um, as somebody just said a moment ago, obviously uh, India and China are in different um, circumstances in terms of development, and uh, so I'm wondering whether you expect to see that uh, 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 negotiating front that um, remains about as it is or gets stronger or that cracks may come into it to make it uh, weaker in the future. Jake, you want to I'd actually like to hear what Arvin had to say about that first. I mean, I'm, I'm several degrees removed from um, from the basic group, so. <laughs> um, I mean, I, I think you're you're right on, on in the, to raise the question because, in terms of substance, I think as we go forward, I mean, as with everything else about international cooperation that uh, there are going to be as many intra-developing country issues as there are you know, country issues between the, the rich and the poor. Um, especially since I think uh, 
you know, the, the situation is, is quite different, not just in terms of, for example, income levels, you know, which, uh, which is one, one uh, dimension of equity, but also, frankly, in terms of, you know, the cleanliness of countries. You know, Brazil is in a very different situation from India and China, um, as, as is South Africa. So, so I think at some stage, uh, those those differences will surface, but I think timing-wise, uh, that will happen probably a bit later in the process, because you know, uh, in some ways, the first-order issues. I mean, I'm not saying uh, that's not my ranking, but but certainly politically, the big issues will be you know, uh, what are the you know basic equity uh, dimensions of the deal, and then we'll have to start talking about what the. Uh, uh, the, the other obligations that developing countries will have to make. And, and of course, you know, the point that I, I want to make and, and would like to make is that on MRV, for example, I think there's a huge difference between ought to be between India and China. You know, um, India has uh, probably many, many more domestic NGOs who are going after the government in terms of what they're doing than perhaps even the United States. So, so it's not obvious why India should convert that asset into a liability internationally. So, so, so you know, so on, on income levels, on, on, on basic, you know, what the endowments are, hydro versus coal, on, on um, openness and transparency, I mean, there are substantive dis uh, differences between these countries, uh, uh, but I suspect they will show up later rather than sooner because of these things. I'm mindful of the time, so let's take a final round of questions and, and then come back to the panel. So let's we'll start with Frank. Thank you. Uh, my question involves MRV. If it's as important as uh, the panel suggested, and I agree with that, uh, the question is how to strengthen that, and it seems to me that at uh, Copenhagen, uh, the extent to which uh, MRV was recognized, that had to sort of be pulled out of uh, a lot of uh, reluctant hands. And my sense is that part of that is, uh, and I've seen that in at least two developing countries, or two non-Annex I countries, part of that problem was really an issue of sovereignty, a feeling that uh, the MRV process uh, was going to involve uh, an invasion of sovereignty, kind of a Jesse Helms-like attitude on the part of other countries. And I had the feeling that part of that uh, might be influenced by the fact that if you have an, a, a, um, an intensity target, uh, that there has to be some verification of both the numerator and the denominator. Uh, both the uh, emission reductions and the GDP. I wonder if you have any comments on what you think is the reluctance to, uh, to deal with MRV more robustly and whether you have some ideas as to techniques for uh, uh, verifying that would minimize the sovereignty issue. Okay, let's hold, hold that. That's clearly in your domain, Jake, and I'll turn to the back there. Right, straight back. Thank you. Um, Melanie Mickelson Graham, House Foreign Affairs Committee. So say the amounts that are proposed in the in the Carrie Lieberman bill stay and pass. What involvement do you see for international institutions of the raising or management of both public and private funds for adaptation and mitigation as were proposed in, in Copenhagen? Um, and any other funding that you think is uh, needed Thanks. And then the lady here. Hi, this is Namrata Patodia with the Pew Center on Global Climate Change. Um, I want to thank the panelists for a great um, um, stimulating discussion. Um, I had a quick question actually following up on uh, Melanie's question. Um, Arvind brought up a very interesting point about um, financing and the fact that developing countries might actually be providing financing within climate change. And we've seen India set up the SARC Climate Change Fund. We heard Brazil and Copenhagen talk about uh, contributing a certain amount of funding for other developing countries. I was wondering, um, of course, in the Copenhagen Accord, it's only the developed countries that have committed to the $100 billion, and we haven't really heard any other discussion about the possibility of developing countries or the non-Annex I countries making any contributions. Do the panelists think that is it's still on the table, and if yes, in what form would it be within a UNFCCC-like fund, or whether it would be, you know, uh, regional uh, funds like what India has done, um, or domestic funds? Just uh, if the panelists could comment on that, thanks. 
Okay, thanks very much. Uh, Jake, uh, I think you're first up. Okay, on uh, Frank's question on, on, on MRV. Um, well, I think that, that we, we, we need to start with the basics. And, and the basics, not the countries, but the basics, basics, um, are really about trying to get the, the reporting and the data transparent and comparable. Uh, and, and making sure that we, we close the gap between what has been expected of the what are now major emitting developing countries and what's been expected of industrialized countries. And uh, to me, it's very important to get that, 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 that platform of information sharing transparent and, and comparable. And there is quite a, a good history in both the Kyoto Protocol and the Framework Convention in, in developing those common reporting frameworks. Um, what is of concern is that I think in, in anticipation that U.S. legislation in particular might um, want to present numbers and analyze data in a way that was particularly responsive of U.S. domestic concerns, particularly in the area of land use and agriculture, that the U.S. has shown a reluctance to play its traditional leadership role in really trying to forge those kind of transparent and comparable systems for, for sharing information. Um, and, and I think that, that that's one of the, the, the pieces of the, of the puzzle that's fallen out as we've moved from, from top down to bottom up, an appreciation that there are certain things that have to be agreed multilateral in, in order for the system to work at all. But I really think that that is the first front that needs to be um, uh, taken on, is, is improving that, the, the system of reporting. The next stage along, of course, is what, how those reports then reviewed and verified. Uh, and then is, is there an opportunity to respond if there are difficulties with the data that's being presented and there are questions about whether a country is complying. I think those need to be moved uh, towards more gradually, particularly in terms of bringing a, a, a degree of symmetry between developed and developing countries that are, are major emitters. But we've got to start with the, getting the data right and, and transparent and comparable. Um, what else? Uh, the role of international financial institutions um, in, in providing funding that might emerge from uh, domestic sources or elsewhere. I mean, this is where I actually think there's some benefit for um, greater diversification. I, I don't think that the institutions that have been traditionally entrusted with moving these funds, whether it's the World Bank or the UN, have done all that well. Um, in, in part due to, their, to, due to the, the demands of their member states, but in part because of bureaucracy and their very complex mandates to both alleviate poverty and respond to climate change and do all the other hundreds of things that they're, they're intending to do, I think leads them to be not particularly focused or outcome-oriented in the way in which they move, move money. And so the fact that there are, there are funds that are being developed both uh, internationally but also bilaterally that are much more targeted and that are much more performance-oriented like the relationship between Norway and Brazil over the Amazon, I, I think is actually a good thing. And, and as long as the, the, the power dynamic between the donors and the recipients is managed sensitively in a way perhaps that Norway can do and, and the United States cannot, um, I, I think that, that that proliferation of funds, bilateral, national, um, plurilateral, is, is probably a good thing um, for the moment. Robin? Um, no, just uh, uh, briefly on, on the, the non-annex one financing, um, as you said, some of these things have started in, in, in a very small way, regionally, nationally. Um, but the, the Mexico does have a serious proposal on the table about, uh, you know, non-annex annex one countries also contributing to a technology fund. So I, I'm very much hoping that those kinds of ideas will start get, getting more traction uh, as we go along. And, and I want that to, to g gain traction also to kind of uh, influence what you know we call the narrative on climate change, which is that you know uh, the, 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 the non-annex one countries are always being seen as you know naysayers. You know if, if they start making these positive contributions, then I think uh, that could also contribute to changing some of the mindsets about you know who does what and, and why. I want to thank everybody who stayed to the bitter end, <laughs> or hopefully interesting end, and uh, I think this will adjourn the, the meeting today. And I want to especially thank Trevor who organized it.